be seated. Sally, could you turn to the hymn 482, please? And our brother Matthew is here. And uh, just sing this little couple of verses of this hymn for our brother Matthew. And uh, pray that the Lord will bless even these words uh, of this hymn. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. For thou art the potter, and I am the clay. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way, thou art the potter, and I'm just the clay, mold me and make me after thy will, while I am waiting, yielded and still, have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. And try me, Master, today. Whiter than snow, Lord, wash me just now, as in thy presence, humbly I'll bow. Have thine own way, dear Lord, have thine own way, wound it, and I'm weary, oh help me, I pray, power of Touch me and heal me, Savior divine. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Hold o'er my being. Absolute sway, fill with thy spirit till all shall see Christ only always living. Let's open our Bibles, please, in Genesis chapter 42, 42nd chapter of the book of Genesis. Read some verses here into the chapter 43. Genesis chapter 42, verse 23. And they knew not that Joseph understood them, for he spake unto them by an interpreter. And he turned himself about from them and wept and returned to them again, communed with them and took from them Simeon and bound him before their eyes. Then Joseph commanded to fill their sacks with corn and to restore every man's money into his sack and to give them provision for the way. And thus did he Unto them. And they laded their asses with the corn and departed hence. And as one of them opened his sack to give his ass provender, in the inn he espied his money. 
for behold, it was in his sack's mouth. And he said unto his brethren, My money is restored, and lo, it is even in my sack. And their heart failed them. They were afraid, saying one to another, What is this that God hath done unto us? And they came unto Jacob their father, unto the land of Canaan, and told him all that befell unto them, saying, The man who is the Lord of the land spake roughly to us and took us for spies of the country. We said unto him, We are true men, we are no spies. We be twelve brethren, sons of our father. One is not, and the youngest is this day with our father in the land of Canaan. And the man, the Lord of the country, said unto us, Hereby shall I know that ye are true men. Leave one of your brethren here with me, and take food for the famine of your households, and be gone. And bring your youngest brother unto me. Then shall I know that ye are no spies, that ye are true men. So I will deliver you, your brother, and ye shall traffic in the land. And it came to pass, as they emptied their sacks, that, behold, every man's bundle of money was in a sack. And when both they and their father saw the bundles of money, they were afraid. And Jacob their father said unto them, Me have ye bereaved of my children. Joseph is not, and Simeon is not. And ye will take Benjamin away. All these things are against me. And Reuben spake unto his father, saying, Slay my two sons, if I bring him not to thee, deliver him into my hand, and I will bring him to thee again. And he said, My son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead and he is left alone. If mischief befall him by the way in the which ye go, then shall ye bring, me down, bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to the grave. And the famine was sore in the land, it came to pass that when they had eaten up the corn which they had brought out of Egypt, their father said unto them, Go again, buy us a little food. And Judas spake unto him, saying, The man did solemnly protest unto us, saying, Ye shall not see my face, except your brother be with you. If thou wilt send our brother with us, we will go down and buy thee food, but if thou wilt not send them, we will not go down. For the man said unto us, Ye shall not see my face, except your brother be with you. And Israel said, Wherefore dealt ye so well with me? Has to tell the man whether he had yet a brother? And they said, The man asked us straightly of our state and of our kindred, saying, Is your father yet alive? Have ye another brother? And we told him according to the tenor of these words. Could we certainly know that he would say, Bring your brother down. And Judah said unto Israel his father, Send the lad with me, and we will arise and go, that we may live and not die. Both we and thou and also our little ones. I will be surety for him. Of my hand shalt thou require him, if I bring him not unto thee, and set him before thee, then let me bear the blame forever. forever. For except we have lingered, surely now we have returned the second time. And their father Israel said unto them, if it must be so now, do this. Take of the best fruit of the land in your vessels and carry down the man a present, a little balm, a little honey, spices, myrrh, nuts, almonds, and take double money in your hand and the money that was brought again in the mouth of your sack. Carry it again in your hand. Per adventure, it was an oversight. Take also your brother and arise, go again unto the man. And God Almighty give you mercy before the man that he may send away your other brother and Benjamin if I be bereaved of my children. I am bereaved. And the men took the present that they took double money in their hand and Benjamin and rose up went down to Egypt and stood before Joseph. 
God will add his blessing to the reading of his precious word for his name's sake. Let's just seek the face of God in prayer. Let us pray together, please. Our gracious God and heavenly Father, we thank thee this morning for thy precious word. We have read it together in thy house. We pray that by thy Holy Spirit that thou would write thy word now upon our hearts as we meditate upon it. O oh God, speak to me that I might speak in living echo of thy tone. Cover us afresh in the precious blood, O oh God. May we know the sweetness of thy presence around the book. For we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. In difficult circumstances, walking in wisdom, walking godly. In this passage of God's Word that we've read together in chapter 42, we reminded you last Lord's Day that Joseph is testing his brothers to see what really is in their hearts. The brothers have been three days in prison, and they begin to ponder the past. Although some people suggest that a prison repentance often can't be trusted. Sometimes when people have their back against the wall, they cry out to God and say, oh God, please help me. And Lord, if you help me and you deliver me or you heal me, Lord, I'll serve you. And then when God heals them, they forget him. But friend, God is doing a work in the heart of these brothers here in this prison. And all known to them as they talk together and they reminisce about the past and their guilt and their sins of the past of what they have done to Joseph, they don't realize that Joseph hears every single word because he's speaking through an interpreter. And so they do not know it is Joseph. Neither do they know that he understands what they're saying. And what Joseph witnesses is this. He witnesses the softness and the softening of the hearts of these hard men. Now, in our study here in this chapter already, we've noticed the reply, and we've noticed the response, or the replay and the response, and now I want us to notice the reaction. Because it says in verse number 24, and he turned himself about from them and wept. You know, if ever a man could have a reason for bitterness and revenge, it was Joseph, because of the ill treatment of what these brothers have done against him. And yet what we find is this, that he turns around and he weeps because he demonstrates his godly character. He demonstrates a heart of love for his brothers, even when they did not love him. And of course, the Lord Jesus Christ reminds us of his, in his precious word that he loved us even when we did not love him. Before that we ever loved him, God set his love upon our hearts. You remember the Lord Jesus Christ in a city that had rejected him, and he looked over Jerusalem, and as he saw that city of rebellion and that city of sin, the Bible says that Jesus wept over sinners that had gone astray. You know, the Word of God says that true love, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. And so when we find these men, their softening of their hearts, and Joseph realizes for the first time that they're acknowledging their guilt and their sin, Joseph's heart goes out to them because Joseph has seen in his life up until this very moment the very hand of God. And you say, well, why did he turn away? Because Joseph cannot allow his emotions to take over. I believe at this moment the natural thing of Joseph to do was this. He would have said when he heard them saying, listen, we are guilty. We should not have done this. We sinned against the child or brother. When he heard that, my, what Joseph wanted to do was just put his arms around his brother and hug them and said, you know, I'm glad I'm Joseph, your brother. 
But he was willing to let God have his way. He wanted to see how God was going to work this out. And so therefore, he could not allow his emotions to overrule his God-ordained duty. And his actions were carefully guided by the Lord. And that's important for you and me as Christians. That as you and I go out into the world today, that we allow our actions to be guided by the Lord, not the flesh not even by our emotions, but we should allow our actions to be guided by the Lord because he had a deep longing for the spiritual well-being of his brothers. And my friend, in God's work and in God's house, that's what we ought to have. In what we do, even with other believers, we should have a desire for the spiritual growth and maturity and the well-being of our brother. And if we have to do something, my friend, we do it because we love them for Christ. It is for their well-being. And even when we discipline them and when we rebuke them, we do not out of bitterness, but we do it out of well-being and out of a heart of love. And so Joseph turns away and he weeps. He commands that the sacks be filled with the corn. He says to those who are in the granary, he says, listen, put the money, put the money, every man's money in his sack. And so we find that that was so, and the men made their way out of Egypt. Joseph's brothers made their way home. There was a long distance to go, and therefore they came to a place, they came to an inn where they had to stop. And one of the brothers realized that that he needed to give his animal feed. And so he opened up the sack, and when he opened up the sack, what did he find? He not only found the grain there, he found that there in the mouth of the sack was his money. And friend, the Bible says in verse 28, it says, My money is restored, and lo, it is even in my sack, and their heart failed them. They were in a strange land. They had an uneasy conscience. And I believe there was another replay in the life of Joseph, because remember this. Why did the brothers sell Joseph? They sold him for money. They sold him for money. That's what Judas said to them. Let's sell him. We don't need to kill him. Let's sell him and see what we get for him. Because money was their God. They were men that loved just to grab and get money. It didn't matter whether they sold their brother to get it. They would get it whatever way they got it. And friend, you and I have got us again as believers... The Word of God does not say money is the root of all evil, but the Word of God says it is the love of it. It's whenever it takes over our lives, whenever that is something that we're willing to get, no matter how deceitful we are. You say, well, everybody's doing it. Well, my friend, you're not everybody. You're a child of God, and as a child of God, God's children are new creatures in Christ Jesus. And we're not to live like the enemy does. And so the money was placed in their sack. They sold Joseph into bondage because of their love of money. And you see, when they saw that money in the sack... Friend, there was fear in their heart. You know why? Because it seemed as if they had stolen the grave, the grain. They were thieves. Joseph had accused them of being spies, and now they have their money in the sack and they've got the grain, but they didn't pay for it. Have you and I something we haven't paid for? Yes, salvation, we can't pay for that. But Christ has paid for it. But my friend, God's children ought to pay the price. 
We sing the words, Have thine own way, Lord. Thou art the potter, and I'm just the clay. Make me and mold me after thy will. Lord, here I am. Take all that I am, Lord. But have we paid the price of what we have? In our earthly days, in our earthly lives, and my, when they saw the money, it was as if they had stolen the grain. The, the grain. And the Bible says their heart failed. In other words, their heart went forth. They began to shake. They began to tremble. Isn't it amazing how God works here? When you look at verse 28 with me a moment, please. And he said unto his brethren, My money is restored, and lo, it is even in my sack. And their heart failed them, and they were afraid, saying one to the other, What is this that God hath done unto us? Now listen, my friend, this is the first time God's mentioned. This is the first time that these brothers mention God. God wasn't in their story until their back's against the wall. And whenever they were standing there shaking and their heart went forth and they were trembling there and they looked into the sack and they saw their money, they said, what is this that God has done? They didn't say, this is what the governor of Egypt has done. No, they knew this was more than the governor of Egypt. They knew this was the finger of God. They knew this was something God had done. And all the evil they did in the past. Let me tell you, up to this moment, God had been pushed aside. But I can tell you, God's not pushed aside. They didn't even think of God before that, friend. God wasn't even mentioned in the prison. They were guilty. They were searching their own hearts. They said, listen, uh, we, have, we have sinned against the child. They've done all these things, but God wasn't even mentioned. And I can tell you, my friend, he's hard men. There's something different about this because the moment they opened the sack and they looked in, they found out. Yes, their sin had found them out once again. And for the first time, they said, what is this that God hath done? unto us. Sometimes, let me tell you, friend, God allows people to go on when there comes to stop. God allowed these brothers to go on for 22 years, friend. But God brought them to the end of themselves and they looked into simply a sack. And when they looked at the sack and they looked at the grain and they looked at the gold, friend, they cried out, what has God done unto us? What is this that God has done? Thank God, God hadn't left them alone. God had followed them for all those years. There's people in God's house today, friend, be honest before God, God has followed you all these years. You've left God out to the side or you pushed God to the side. But God once again is reminding you that he's following after you. He's speaking still to your heart. Thank God he is. And they know they have done wrong now. They also know that God is bringing what they have done wrong to light. Because the wound must be cleansed before the wound can be healed. There must be a cleansing before the healing can begin. Psalm 51 verse 6 says, Thou desirest truth in the inward part. And what that means is this, from the inside out. I want to tell you that's what God desires, friend. Thou desirest truth in the inward part. Man looketh on the outward appearance. It's God that looks in the heart. And what God desires, friend, he wants cleanliness from the inside out. He doesn't want a cover-up job. There has to be a deep cleansing. There has to be.
has to be a deep cleansing. And if there are those here this morning, and friend, you're living on a false profession, I want to tell you, God desires truth from the inward part. He wants you cleansed from the inside out. Give me your heart. Oh, I tell you, these boys aren't bold anymore. They're not the strong men anymore. They're shaking now, and they make their way to their father. Verse number 29, they came on to Jacob, their father. And when they go back to Jacob, their father, they tell him what has happened to them. What has happened to this man that they have met down there in Egypt? And then they tell him, they say, Father, you know, one of us, we opened our shacks. And we were going to give provender to our, to our animals. You know what we find? We find the gold in the mouth of our sack. And then the Bible says, in verse number 35, it came to pass as they emptied their sacks. Behold, every man's bundle of money was in their sack. Every last one of them. And when both they and their father saw the bundles of money, they were afraid. You know what I see? I, I, I say to you, there's a change in these boys, and so there is. Because whenever these boys come home to their father, friend, they make a confession to their father of what has happened to them along the way. And what I see is this. These lads are not openly lying to their father. They deceived their father before. But now they're not openly lying to their father. There's a change in them. And Jacob said in verse 36, And Jacob their father said unto them, Me have ye bereaved of my children. Joseph is not, Simeon is not, and ye have taken, ye, ye will take Benjamin away. All these things are against me. He cries out in the midst of this, my friend, Here is the father of the family. He doesn't see the hand of God in this. All he sees is the hand of man. These brothers, they see the hand of God for the first time, but their father doesn't. He doesn't encourage them. All their father says is this, Me have ye believed. And my children, Joseph is not, Simon is not. Ye have take, ye will take Benjamin away. All these things are against me. All he can see in is the hand of man. Not the hand of God. You know why? Two things. First of all, Jacob has forgotten the promises of God. Friends, sometimes whenever we're in trouble and our backs are against the wall and we're in days of darkness and my, the old devil says, you're all alone. Have you forgotten the promises? Are you like Jacob? You've forgotten the promises of God. What did God promise him? Just keep your hand there. Turn back to chapter 28. Chapter 28. Of the book of Genesis, look at verse number 13. And Jacob was dreaming. And behold the Lord, verse 13, chapter 28, Behold the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abram thy father, and the God of Isaac. The land whereon thou liest to thee will I give it unto thy seed. God promised seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. Jacob, remember this, and in thee, and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And behold, I am with you, and I will keep thee in all places wherever thou goest. All places. He says, I 
I will keep you in all places wherever thou goest, and will bring thee again into this land. For I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. What promises, friend? What more could he need? And yet when the brothers say to him, listen, we want to take Benjamin with us down to Egypt to get food and to bring Simeon home, he started to cry. He didn't see the hand of God. He saw the hand of man. And he said, ye, 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 me. No mention of God. Let me tell you, in your life and mine, friend, there are no mistakes with God and there are no accidents with God. There are appointments. And I tell you, Romans chapter 8, verse 28, it does mean what it says, all things work together for good. To them that love God, have you forgotten the promises today? Jacob did. He forgot the promises. I'll tell you the second thing about him. Jacob not only had forgotten the promises which God had given, Jacob was judging by circumstances. What was happening at that moment in his life, friend, that's all he could see. And the circumstance was a dark circumstance. The path he was walking, which was a lonely pathway. But when I read those words there, he says, all these things are against me. Where is God? The God of Jacob. Where is the God of Jacob? There's not a word of trust in God here. He just looked at his circumstances as they were before him at that moment. He says, all this is against me. And maybe there's someone here this morning. Maybe there are many here this morning. And you're looking at your circumstance. And you say, listen, Brother McRae. All these things are against me. It seems to be that the clouds are hovering over me. And they're getting darker instead of brighter. Let me tell you what it says in Proverbs chapter 3, friend. It says, Trust in the Lord with all thy heart, and lean not on thine own understanding, and all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. Here was the father of the home, friend. And God Almighty was the God of Jacob. And yet he's crying out in his situation, all these things are against me. And yet there was a son, Joseph, for 22 years in affliction. And never once did he complain against God, friend, or never once did he charge God foolishly. But he had to learn just to lean upon the sovereignty of God. He never doubted God in his affliction. You see, whenever he said those words, end of verse 36, he said, all these things are against me. Friend, that was not true. Because Jacob was on the verge of a miracle. Jacob was on the verge of the greatest reunion in his life. Joseph and Simeon were alive and well. Benjamin was in no danger whatsoever. For God had already made the way of escape for them. But he couldn't see it. You know, maybe... Maybe Jacob, whenever he looked into those sacks and he saw the money, maybe just for a moment he thought, did they sell Simeon for money? One thing I do know is this. 
He just was a slave to his circumstances. And had no eye on God. And maybe today your eyes are so dim with tears because of circumstances and what has happened to you in your life, friend, that to be honest, your eye is not upon the Lord today. I think it's an amazing thing here. Here was the ungodly sons of this man acknowledging the hand of God and yet their spiritual leader and father of the home. He just thought it was bad luck. Foolishness. Folly. And he couldn't see it, friend. He couldn't see it because of his circumstances. Listen, things were never better for Jacob and his family. But he didn't have a clue. God was working the situation out for their good. Joseph was not only alive. And the father thought he was dead, but he wasn't only alive. He was that big ruler in Egypt. Simeon was not in danger down there in Egypt. What Simeon was doing, he was resting soundly under the providential care of his younger brother. And he was eating in abundance. Benjamin. Benjamin was not in danger going down to Egypt to meet Joseph. No, he was about to be reunited to his only blood brother. They were on the verge of a miracle. And what did he say? Oh, this is against me. And you want to take, you want to take Benjamin? My son, verse 38, shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead. And he's left alone. If mischief shall befall him on the way in the which ye shall go, then shall you bring me down you bring down my grey hairs with sorrow to grave. Actual fact, it was the opposite. All these things were working for him. They weren't against him. They were for him. You see, when God's working in your life, and my friend, even when God's disciplining us, God's working for you. God does it because he loves you. God's working together for your good. And then Reuben speaks up and he said, Father, he says, Father, slay my two sons if I bring them not to thee again. And deliver them into your hand, and, 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 and deliver Benjamin into my hand, and I will bring them to thee again. And Jacob says, No. It's not happening. You know, here again is a change in these brothers. For the first time, in their lives, friend. They wanted to prove to this what man down in Egypt, they wanted to prove that they were true men. Up to that moment, they'd been cheats. But they had given their word, and God was working in their hearts. And the tragedy is this, friend. For the first time in their lives, they were endeavoring to be true. And the Father became the barrier. To them doing it. Parents, be careful. Be careful with your children. Don't be a barrier to your child. What kind of a testimony are you showing? What kind of a testimony are you sharing? with your children in the days of trial. Tell me, what do they see? And here are lads whose hearts are changing, friend. And they look at the old man, Jacob. 
and there's no trust in God. They saw the hand of God. He didn't. Ah, yes, they knew the hand of God was the hand of God in, 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 in judging them and punishing them for their wrongdoing. But Jacob didn't see the hand of God in blessing them. And they wanted to prove to this man down there in Egypt that they were true. You know, our trustworthiness affects not only our reputation, but it affects the reputation of Christ. Your word should be our bond. And friend, it's important that you and I keep our commitments and the words and the promises that we make. For it's better not to make a commitment than to fail to honor it. And Jacob said, you're not taking my son. You're not taking my son. And then you move to chapter 43 very quickly before we close. You know, it's amazing. From that moment, there's no record. Because remember, they had grain. They had food. There's no record that Joseph was ever mentioned again. Until the food ran out. Chapter 43. The famine was sore in the land. Ah, yes, they ate the plenty. They ate the grain. They enjoyed the grain that they had gotten down there in Egypt. But friend, let me tell you, no mention recorded by the Holy Ghost of Joseph. Not even Simeon mentioned. Out of sight, out of mind. Remember the missions we used to say when they went to the mission field and people used to gather around the docks in Belfast and I remember it way back 45 years ago. Used to gather around and they used to sing God be with you till we meet again and many of the missionaries said I'm glad they sang that God be with you till we meet again because certainly if God hadn't been with us they certainly weren't because we're out of sight and out of mind. The missionaries were forgotten. Ah, but the famine. And their life just carried on normal. And then it said in verse 2, And it came to pass, and it will always come to pass, friend, when they had eaten up the corn. Yes, they came to the end of the resources that got down there in Egypt. Ah, yes, they enjoyed them whilst they had it. But it came to pass when they'd eaten up the corn when they had, that which they had brought out of Egypt, their father said unto them, Go again, buy us a little food. Buy us a little food. You know, Jacob seems to blank out of his mind. Listen, no mention of what the Lord down there in Egypt said. No mention even of Simeon. The father says, listen, I want you to go down to Egypt and buy us a little food. In other words, he said, would you slip down into Egypt? And slip out a little food. Brent, can you imagine what was going on in this family? You think of the arguments that was going on in the family? If you look in verse number 8, it said, And Judah said unto Israel, his father, Send the lad with me, and we will arise and go, that we may live and not die, both we and there and thou, and also our little ones. Their circumstances of necessity forced them to think again of Egypt. And that brings us to the reality they needed Food that we may die, that we may live and not die. And then Judah spoke up. And Judah spake, verse number three, we'll close here, these verses, this thought of Judah. And Judah spake unto Jacob, that's unto his father, saying, The man did solemnly protest unto us, saying, Ye shall not see my face except your brother be with you. You see, here's the reality, friend. 
There was no slipping into Egypt. The man who had got the corn was the man who said, bring your brother down or you'll not see my face again. And sometimes we live, let me tell you, and we bury our heads in the sand. We don't want to face reality. But I can tell you, they didn't want to face reality. Reality faced them. And you and I can't run from reality. There are things in life that you and I can't run from, friend. And Reuben had tried his best to reason with Jacob, but to no avail. And so therefore, uh, he wasn't willing to face reality. He puts off the inevitable until the situation gets to that crisis uh, proportion that they're now forced into the situation. He says, go down, go down and bring us and buy us a little food. And Judah said, the man solemnly protested, ye shall not see my face except your brother be with me. And then he says this to his father, listen to this. If thou wilt send our brother with us, we will go down and buy thee food. But if thou wilt not send him, we will not go down. I want to tell you, my friend, I do not believe here that this lad was acting arrogantly and speaking back to his father. I believe that Judah's children were hungry and crying out for food. And the old man Jacob was stubborn and wouldn't allow Benjamin to go and get it. This was not arrogance on behalf of Judah. This was not being disrespectful to his father. But he believed the Egyptian governor, he really meant what he said ye shall not see my face. They had already been accused of being spies. Could you imagine if they had been slipping down to get little grain and they were caught? What they're now going to be accused of? He says, Father, we can't do it. And you know, there are some things that need to be said, friend, and there's no easy way of saying it. And there was no easy way for Judy to tell his father Listen, it's as clear as this, Dad. If you don't send the lad with us, we're not going down. Because the Lord of the Egypt said, Ye shall not see my face except your brother be with you. Father's as clear as that. You know, there's no easy way for a doctor to tell a patient that they haven't long to live. There's no easy way. And sometimes people say, you know, he was very abrupt and said, let me tell you, there is no easy way to be told that. And sometimes we have to be told it in love for the person. It has to be said as it really is. He said, the man did solemnly protest. In other words, the man warned us. Father, the man warned us. In actual fact, he went further. He actually swore by the life of Pharaoh. In chapter 42, in verse 15 and 16, he said this. Of chapter 42, verse 15, Hereby ye shall be proved. By the life of Pharaoh ye shall not go Four thence, except your younger brother come thither. Send one of you and let him fetch your brother, and ye shall be kept in prison that your words may be proved, whether they be true or not, or else by the life of Pharaoh, surely your spies. And because of that, he says, Father, if you don't send Benjamin with us, we will not go down. If you agree to send, we'll go. If you don't, we'll not. For Judah knew what was the reality of the situation, and he was unable to change it. My friends, let me tell you, there are realities for you and me today, and you and I can't change it. And this is the thought I'm leaving with you. And it's for the unsaved in this meeting. There's a reality. And friend, you can't change this. 
The reality is, it's appointed unto man once to die. You can't change that. Prepare to meet thy God. You can't change that. You'll meet God. And you'll either be ready for it or you'll not be ready. And if you're not ready, here's another reality. And the wicked shall be cast into hell. Now, there's no easy way to say that. But it's true. You need to be saved. You need your sins forgiven. You need to be cleansed in the blood of the Lamb. Or you'll not be ready to meet God. Let's pray. Heavenly Fathers, we bow in thy holy presence this morning. We thank thee for thy precious word. I pray, O God, that not only will you bring the realities before each of us in the midst of life we are in death. We know not the day, we know not the hour, but, O God, we must be ready. And I pray this morning that men and women, young people, will not just leave the house of God unready and unprepared. But, O oh God, I pray in Jesus' name that this morning that they'll run to Christ, that they'll call upon the Savior, and they'll repent of their sin, claim the covering of the cleansing blood of Jesus. Lord, I pray that you'll bless your people. Help them, our God, to have a godly testimony in difficult circumstances, to walk in wisdom, to walk godly. Oh, that the world will see Christ in us as we live before them. Bless us as we come in thy will to thy house again this evening. Oh, God, have a word for us. And God, give a hunger in people's heart to hear thy word. Oh, we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen.